2010-2011, if I'm not mistaken. And at that time, uh, we were looking at the ASEAN economic community, and the goal was to create a global services hub. And so we were talking about which industries to look at, and we figured, I think maybe we should look at the uh, creative industries. I didn't know what the creative industry stand was. So I'll just start with the definition, which says that creative industries are actual activities that have their origin in individual creativity, skill, and talent, which have a potential for job and wealth creation through the generation and exploitation of intellectual property. Now, the interest on creative industries stems from the fact that over the last, you know, the, the recent past, creative industries have been rapidly growing. In 2013, our revenues are two trillion two hundred and fifty billion thereabouts, jobs at 29.5 million, and the top three markets uh, in order are Asia, Pacific, Europe, and North America. Moreover, uh, it is a vehicle for the online economy. Global digital sales account for about 200 billion in 2013 of the total revenue, and the global digital devices sales are 530 billion. So really, this is a growing, rapidly growing industry. And since the ASEAN is in the middle of the largest market, it justifies uh, the study, the focus of that particular study. Uh, if we look at um, creative industries, according to the uh, Contra de la Chon International, the societies, the authors, and F compositors. I don't think I'm doing justice to the French language, but that's it. It is comprised of at least 11 subsectors, including advertising, gaming, and music. But if you're going to look at it in terms of revenue and jobs, these are the top three. So for revenue, it's television with about a fifth of the total global sales, visual arts at 17.1%, newspapers and magazines still ranking a third, 15.5%. But in terms of jobs, uh, visual arts creates the most jobs at 21.4%, music at 12.6%, and television <coughs> at 11.2%. Now, I was paying attention to Dr. Leonto's uh, keynote address this morning, and what he said was, our concern when it comes to globalization and integration should be that, um, to quote, those who were left behind, we should really take a look at those things. Well, in the La Salle University, we call them the last, the lost, and the least. And if you take a look at the creative industries, actually the creative industries are rather inclusive. Uh, in Europe, typically they employ more people aged 15 to 29, the youth, where unemployment is traditionally or conventionally at the highest. In the United Kingdom, women account for more than 50% of employment, particularly in the music industry, and they are driven by small businesses and individuals. Uh, for emerging countries, so uh, the biggest employers in the informal sector are actually in the creative industries with about 40 million jobs and a sales of about 33 uh, billion still in 2013. Moreover, it boosts the city's attractiveness if you're talking about tourism, if you're talking about concerts, uh, culture, and so on. So really, uh, I guess that fits today's theme when it comes to exploring those sectors, those industries that cater to those who may be left behind by globalization. Um, in Asia Pacific, the largest uh, market, uh, the largest market because it, is a, it has a booming middle class, about 1.25 billion connected to the internet or 47% of the global online population. 87% of all adults have smartphones and 23% of global digital sales. Uh, is also accounted for by the Asia Pacific region. There is preference for newspapers, primarily in India, and video games are focused on the Japan, Korea, and China market. Now, for the ASEAN, I think we can build on this uh, the fact that UNESCO's Creative Cities Network lists the following uh, cities as creative cities. You have Bandung, Indonesia for design. Becca Longland in Indonesia for Crafts and Folk Art, Phuket in Thailand for Gastronomy, and Singapore for Design. So there's a lot to build on in the ASEAN if you take a look at creative industries. So creative industries in the ASEAN, but the focus of the study is the Philippines. And if you look at digital animation, actually the paper, and now I get to promote the paper, right? It's published. Uh, there's a, a, it's a chapter in the book that was published by Iria in 2010, 2011. 
and there are two subsectors of the Philippines that were featured in it, printing and publishing. But today, because I have 20 minutes, we will focus on just one, which is digital animation. For the Philippines, the digital animation is categorized under the IPEPO sector, which is among the fastest growing sectors uh, in the Philippines. And it is the second smallest if you're going to look at the total number of establishments. So I took a look uh, in I looked at the Senate Economic Planning Office report, and what it says there is we have about 49 firms in creative industries, accounting for roughly 8% of the total IPOBPO industry. Um, I updated the paper a little bit, uh, but before we go to the update in the statistics, allow me to define digital animation. Digital animation is 2D animation from layouts to final composing, digital ink, and paint service. 3D animation using the latest software like Maya, XSI, 3D Studio, Max, etc. Reproduction service from storyboarding, character and product design, key backgrounds and layouts. 3D and 2D animation for games, fast animation for animated series. So basically that's what comprises digital animation in the Philippines. And about the, uh, when it comes to the latest statistics, I updated the paper. I found uh, data for 2009 to 2013. And it says there that roughly in terms of revenue, on average, it's about 71 million for digital animation. The export is at 60.8 million, employed some 3,997 workers, and paid about 28.25 million in compensation every year from 2009 to 2000. So that's the latest data that we have. If you're talking about uh, average wages, according to the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, on average, uh, the surveyed animation firms paid about $6,953.5 in, uh, in compensation and growing at about 7% per year from 2010 to 2013. So really, it is a growing industry with a lot of potential. Now, when I first prepared the PowerPoint slides, there were about 40 of them. And Dr. Tuyao said, Pauline, you have 20 minutes. So what I did was to get rid of all the PowerPoint slides and decided that I can talk about everything I need to talk about by looking at the value chain framework. So the general value chain framework, if we apply it to the dig uh, digital animation industry, starting with firm infrastructure. Uh, in 2008, two classified uh, the firms in the digital animation industry into two. The first one is what they call service providers, and these are mostly local firms with foreign affiliations that are engaged in animation services for use in entertainment, business, and education. So examples of these foreign firms will now include Toy Animation, which is a Japanese firm, uh, subsidiary with a Philippine subsidiary that has worked on G.I. Joe, Transformers, Dragon Ball, Sailor Moon, and Naja. I'm not familiar with any of these things, but that's what it introduces. I kind of know G.I. Joe. That was from way back when, but Dragon Ball, I don't know if you've heard of. Oh, you have. Naja never heard of. Millennials. Uh, I'm sorry. It's not even uh, goes to show you what my interest is. Uh, but there's another Malaysian firm also operating in the Philippines, included under service providers. You have the Philippine Animation Studios, Inc. They call it FASI. And there is a Filipino-owned firm classified as service provider, Top Peg Animation and Creative Studio, has worked on Disney TV series like 101 Dalmatians, Stars, and Kim Possible and Hercules. Those are the ones I know. <laughs> and I go to Disneyland every year. That's the happiest place on earth. Um, it is. <laughs> For the second category of firms, you have the local subcontractors. And actually, for the large part, this is where our digital animation firms are classified. Mm -hmm. They are commissioned to work on segments on animation series. They are mostly freelancers. Uh, and uh, local animation industry participants offer a wide range of services, beginning with storyboarding and pre-production stage to dubbing and sound in post-production. But unlike in China, India, South Korea, and Malaysia, most of these Filipino firms virtually have no commercial animator producer in the country, and they actually don't do the conceptualization stage for the most part. We are mostly 
subcontractors. And therefore, according to the Animation Council of the Philippines, Inc., when I interviewed them, uh, really the an digital animation subsector are mostly small and medium enterprises con uh, doing subcontracting work. If we move on to the human resource uh, in the value chain, uh, the biggest concern in human resource management is really keeping the talent. It's not so much that we have, we don't have talent, we do, except that once they are trained, they are they move on to greener pastures. And most of these greener pastures in the ASEAN Singapore. So that's one. And also, for the most part, these uh, talent are freelancers, so they, they move about within either the local industry or, like I said, greener pastures abroad. Um, for the technology itself, the third tier over there, uh, in terms of techniques, animation have basically two. Two-dimensional, which is traditionally hand-drawn, but of late is accomplished with the aid of computers, and three-dimensional, which creates characters that have depth and 3D viewpoints through animation software programs. And interviews with the um, uh, the association tells us that the biggest concern really here would be the high cost of software licenses. Uh, and certainly training, again, our talent in using uh, the software, the latest technologies that are available in the industry. For inbound logistics, so one of the biggest concerns is the prompt and efficient exchange of information with clients. It's a digital age. You need the internet. And actually, that problem with the internet infrastructure in the Philippines also helms outbound uh, logistics. I will talk a little bit about that when we get to that point. For operations, cost management strategies are the primary issues for operations, which can be achieved through training, experienced workers, and automation. Just very briefly, when you talk about operations, you have several stages in digital animation, starting with conceptualization. So it focuses on the development of ideas. And like I said, uh, there are very few firms, if any, in the Philippines that are involved in this stage. Pre-production centers on the creation of a prototype of the film or the series or the game. Production centers on the development of how each character and background would be shown in film, such as colors, textures, shading and lighting, animation, and animal visual effects are also incorporated in the film recording or in the series recording. And that for the most part, Filipinos are involved in post-production work which consists of sound effects, the final musical score, sound mixing, color correction, as well as editing of scenes and retakes if necessary. So again, uh, subcontracting work for operations for Filipino firms. Now we go to the outbound logistics, which is more or less the same problem that we have for inbound logistics. It revolves around finding alternatives to delivering output. We are referring to uh, electronic format, and certainly the delivery of this requires internet infrastructure. And I think the latest report regarding internet infrastructure in the Philippines reveals that we are below the global average. The average is about 7.2 Mbps, and the Philippines is 5.5. Uh, and that means we are the least, the last, and the lost in the internet. <laughs> Uh, among the Asia Pacific countries. So it hampers or it hinders the progress of our uh, digital animation and anybody, in fact, all industries that require internet infrastructure and the efficient delivery of their services. So uh, it may be problematic in the Philippines. It becomes very costly, certainly, to be able to deliver the output, to communicate with our clients, to exchange information because of internet infrastructure. When it comes to marketing and sales, as we pointed out earlier, there is a large and growing market for digital animation or for creative industries in general, especially with the introduction of new and improved gadgets that utilize animation services like gaming. And the domestic market also remains to be relatively intact for local firms. Uh, competition, however, forces firms in the subsector to choose between competing on the basis of quality or product pricing. So it's one or the other. Do we compete in terms of quality, which tends to be relatively expensive, especially given the cost of doing business in the Philippines? Or do we go for pricing, in which case the quality may not fare very well in the global market? When it comes to services in our value chain, 
This requires consultation and close coordination among production and post-production providers and can significantly reduce costs and broader spectrum of services offered to clients if we are able to package certain delivery of services. Uh, for the support activities, uh, issues that fall in this category include the availability and cost of skilled labor. So in terms of skilled labor, we can certainly train the talent in the Philippines, but it is rather costly. And what the uh, industry association uh, told me is that most local firms do have in-house training and their expertise really is in 2D animation, so the more conventional type. Um, there is also difficulty in, retrain, in retaining skilled workers, I've already mentioned that. Support activities also includes government support, particularly fiscal incentives. And I took a look at the uh, incentives or the regulations in the government uh, that pertain to the uh, digital animation industry. And what I found is EO 561, which is the formation of the super regions and mandate of super regional development champions. Digital animation is included here. They are also included in the investment priorities plan, which takes care of incentives. And TESTA supported nationwide entry-level training, so TESTA also offers some training for our animators. And last but not the least, when we talk about uh, support activities, uh, it also pertains to financial management, which specifically refers to the task of raising capital. So raising capital for animation firms are very difficult also in the Philippines, given that they are mostly small and medium enterprises. Now, moving up the value chain, so that is the value chain, how do we move from being subcontractors to eventually being the conceptual, uh, the firms that do the concepts uh, for films, for games, for animation uh, work? Well, starting with the availability of creative talent capable of original content development. So we cannot just be doing the work that is asked of us, but we should be able to conceptualize, generate new ideas, unique ideas. And I think it helps that there are now a lot of schools that offer digital animation, multimedia arts in the college level, particularly our sister school, CSB, since we are here, uh, certainly is a pioneer in the industry. Uh, the use of the latest technology, and actually that also pertains not only to the school, the education, but also in the firms uh, that are engaged in animation. Government support both in soft and hard infrastructure, and I think the biggest concern here when you talk about infrastructure is internet. Soft infrastructure, I think it's more or less microfinancing that it involves. Credit and market information. Co-production <coughs> investment alternatives. That's one other thing that I learned when I was looking at this particular topic. In most uh, countries where digital animation is really a successful or a lucrative uh, endeavor, uh, mostly you have joint partnerships. Um, local firms are going, uh, will have joint partnerships with foreign firms that will help them expand their network. And then you have intellectual property. This is very important because you're talking about original work. And of course, uh, foreign direct investors are deterred by the fact that uh, if their intellectual property is not guarded uh, carefully or is not upheld, then certainly they will shy away uh, from countries uh, that do not have strong intellectual property laws. For government intervention, so you have, I was thinking about learning from our neighbors. And in learning from our neighbors, I took a look at what Thailand was doing, what uh, China also is doing in promoting uh, animation industry. And what I found out is that in Singapore and Thailand, they have development funding uh, for local and uh, startup uh, start firms in animation. Uh, Co-production investment programs, and we say co-production, that means it's partnership with the government, not necessarily a private firm. Participation in trade for, uh, for fairs are also subsidized in Thailand, and they encourage local networks to air animation series or films. In China in particular, what I read was that there is a particular time slot every day wherein only local uh, series, animation series, can be shown. Mm -hmm. So they identify a time slot, and usually it's that time slot that uh, kids watch the prime time, uh, and, and they will e-market just for local series and local firms. So it helps uh, move up the local firms into the conceptualization stage. 
growing SME. So since we have mostly small and medium enterprises in the Philippines, then how do we move them up uh, to larger firms? Uh, and building productive capacities is the first one in the list. So I found this all in different uh, literature, in different research work. And so the OTA is saying that specialized education and training, including support for artistic development, is important. Access to financial assistance, which, assistance, which happens to be among the concerns of uh, digital animation firms in the Philippines. Targeting SMEs and strengthening technological infrastructure and modernization, especially since it's rapid uh, changing technology that we encounter in this particular subsector. Incubation centers for uh, startup firms and also for growing firms. Encourage local networks to allocate airtime for locally developed uh, animated works, uh, which is what I learned from China in particular. Uh, regulations protecting, protecting intellectual property rights is very important, especially for original work. And then data collection, there is very little data in digital animation work. And uh, most of the things that I have were able, to, I was able to put in the paper about seven years ago was from the industry association. So if you want data on these industries, you really need to do the interviews and primary data gathering. But if we want to track the performance of the industry and how better to help them, we need to have a centralized data. And that establishment of a source of international market information from which our local firms can learn, can tap, and uh, what do you call this, uh, base their plans on in the future. So increasing access to basic education, continuous skills development, so these are all taken from uh, the different issues that were uh, identified uh, with interviews with the industry, uh, in the industry association under digital animation. <laughs> Now, within ASEAN, actually, I found that the APAS and trading services uh, can be very helpful in promoting digital animation. For example, in mode one, cross-border supply enjoys no significant barriers when you talk about uh, the products and services of digital animation. Commercial presence also offers the best solution to the problem of egress of an animation uh, artist in the Philippine digital animation sector. It also helps with the recommendation regarding partnerships with local firms and foreign firms to expand their network. So basically, in that particular paper, we are looking at where we are when it comes to digital animation in the Philippines, what we can learn from our neighbors uh, who are also involved in that particular industry. And towards the end, when we were presenting the paper to uh, the ASEAN uh, members, uh, to the different members who were involved in the project, we were looking at where we are in the value chain and how we can create a global services hub, particularly in the creative industries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pauline, for that uh, very comprehensive presentation of the creative industries, uh, the opportunities as well as the challenges within the region. Uh, and the next paper is a student paper uh, entitled Tech Liberty, a Threshold Policy Recommendations on Technology Liberalization in ASEAN Countries and the Effects on Income Inequality by Mr. Justin Eloriaga. This paper won the first prize in an international competition held at the University of Indonesia, testing other students from the region, including Singapore. Uh, of course, we benchmark with Singapore again. <laughs> Mr. Justin Eloriaga is currently Assistant Vice President of Academics of the Economics Organization, which is one of our partner institutions is the incoming Young Economist Convention Commissioner for Econor. He's the champion in the 14th Economics Global Economics, Economics Challenge in Indonesia. He's a consistent first honor Dean's Lister, vying for Summa Cum Laude. I didn't know that, okay, but at any rate, <laughs> just say <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, so good morning everyone. Good so morning. again, my name is Justin Elariaga. It's very nice to be here today. So first, I'd like to thank Dr. Tuliao and Dirisi Aki for inviting me to speak in the session today. It's very nice for me to present in front of three of my professors, Dr. Tuliao, <laughs> International Economics, Ms. Pauline Castillo, Operations Research, and Dr. Shira Shar for Development Policy. So three of my professors are here to scrutinize me today. So as mentioned by uh, Dr. Tuliao, this paper was presented by yours truly and Juan Hee Cho, also from Derosal University at the 14th Economics, Global Economics Challenges last year in Indonesia. Uh, the theme of the said competition was on the dark sides of the digital economy, and it's also in this slide that our paper has been predicated on. Today I'd like to zero in on the problem of digital inequality, which is something typically overlooked when we see the concept of inequality. Oftentimes it is mere income that we look at, but when we think of the skills premium emerging from, tech, from constant technological progress, a large part of this premium may have been due to the presence of digital inequality. So uh, I'd like to start with some stylized facts. So first, nine out of 10, nine out of 10 ASEAN countries except Singapore experience high digital and income inequality. This was the motivation for our paper because a fact like this hinders us from progressing as one ASEAN. 35%, there is a 35% smartphone penetration present in the ASEAN region, but this is growing rapidly. Currently in 2017, this number lies at around 50 to 55%. However, this is a relatively low adoption of new technologies, which further distances the technological gap in the ASEAN 10. Sorry. 2025, study shows that the ASEAN has the potential to enter into the top five digital economies in the world by the year 2025. This suggests that the ASEAN has an extreme potential in progressing to digital inclusiveness. All these support Cunningham's study in 2015 which suggested that the digital gap is just as extreme and profound as the income gap in many countries around the world, which is highly evident in ASEAN 2, as shown in the stylized facts in the previous slide that 9 out of 10 ASEAN countries experience high income and digital inequality. When the digital gap is high, there is most likely high income inequality present as they are correlated together. However, we wanted to see this relationship in a more empirical manner, so we conducted um, regression to do so. So first, I'd like to explain the objectives of the study. The first one is to determine the relationship between income inequality and digital inequality in the ASEAN 10. The second is to recommend policies in compliance with the ASEAN Economic Blueprint 2025. So all of these policies that we present should have been in accordance with this particular blueprint. So um, we used a random effects generalized least squares regression. Uh, we, proved this, uh, we proved the use of the random effects model by the Hausmann test and the Walls test, comparing it against fixed effects and various LSTV models, as well as literature backing this up. For the dependent variable, we, uh, we have income inequality measured in the Gini index, and for the independent variable, we have the percentage of internet users' data from global finance. The regression shows that the income inequality is negatively associated with the percentage of internet users, which suggests that higher percentage of internet users show lower income inequality. So this is uh, this is some empirical proof for the points that we will do. So due to the presence of this relationship, we recommend these following policies. Uh, so these were the three policies that we uh, that we promoted in the economics competition. So the first being software literacy, second being accessible public Wi-Fi, and the third, which is trade liberalization. Note that we did this prior to a lot of our major economics classes. We just wanted to try our shot at the competition, and apparently we won. So, <laughs> so the first policy recommendation is advancing software literacy through the implementation of basic software education as part of the BEC. So, uh, so a few things on this. So, software uh, on software literacy. Uh, software literacy, uh, according to researchers, they say that it is the ability to process text documents, browse the web, and use basic computer applications, which in turn would increase productivity in the long run. However, this definition is quite broad and not necessarily quite specific uh, to certain skills, such as maybe computer coding and other basic software functions. And currently, there is a lack of ICT, or Information and Communication Technology related courses, in public schools, with few ICT initiatives initiated by both the private and government towards its development in education. So nevertheless, uh, different ASEAN countries have started their efforts in rollout for technology related subjects as part of their BEC. 
Given that all ASEAN countries adopt the K-12 educational system, it is now easier and more feasible to implement such advancement efforts for a more inclusive, uh, digital, for a more digital inclusive country. For example, uh, Indonesia and uh, Singapore have already started early rollouts of basic coding education in even uh, the elementary levels for uh, schools, not just uh, what we teach in the Philippines currently, it's just the basic office programs. So what are the main takeaways for this? Um, uh, to catch up with modernization uh, mainly, it's to increase chances for lower income population to catch up with modernization. Also, we promote a knowledge-based economy towards inclusive and sustainable growth. And this will tie in with emerging revisions of the BDC in many ASEAN countries, which is actually in line with the ASEAN Economic, Blu Economic Blueprint 2025. So in the long run, it would promote a more efficient and productive workforce that is more knowledgeable in technology, thus make workers from the ASEAN more competent and competitive in the global market. Uh, through this, efforts will be set in place to alleviate income inequality. So our next policy recommendation is making public Wi-Fi accessible through a public-private partnership. So actually yesterday in President Duterte's sauna, he actually highlighted this as, uh, as uh, one of the initiatives that he has done. So, and I quote, he said that there are over 40 locations in the country that have free public Wi-Fi that is of good scale and of good quality. But if you look at the where those locations are planted, they're actually very much in public areas, such as the airport, such as uh, some other uh, museums or historical locations. They aren't necessarily the locations you would actually work in. So um, we believe that the right way to institute public Wi-Fi is through a PPP. So um, why, is, why utilize a PPP and not another system? It's because PPPs are extremely common in developing nations to kickstart various massive infrastructure projects. And uh, why should we make Wi-Fi more accessible? Well, it's to increase infrastructure development for ICT initiatives, particularly in rural areas where in connection is limited. And this is actually one of the specific uh, key points in the ASEAN Economic Blueprint 2025, which is to promote uh, promote uh, accessibility of internet services in rural areas of every country. So, uh, so uh, it must be implemented chronologically. So we, we start with this particular format. So we start first in middle income areas to low and then to high. So uh, it must be implemented chronologically because it must take into account the lag and minimize risk that may arise from starting with heavy subsidies to accommodate the low income communities. This is the most realistic way to implement this initiative in developing countries. So what are the main takeaways from this policy? It's a win-win-win situation for the government, private firms, and citizens of the country. For the government, uh, it would be able to gain funds from external sources without having the need to increasingly increase taxes, yet implement programs that its people would need and want. For firms, it would be able to utilize and maximize their assets in a sustainable investment. And for citizens, it would be able to uh, for a more productive to a more accessible Wi-Fi system nationwide. So uh, to ensure that our target demographic is prioritized, it would be implemented through this gradual rollout scheme as presented earlier. Uh, and note, we are doing this gradual rollout scheme according to Todaro and Smith, wherein two-thirds of all low-income low households exist in rural areas. So this also relates to our first policy recommendation through making Wi-Fi accessible through PPP. Low-income communities would also be able to utilize the knowledge gained from software literacy programs because they have the means to do so. So the first two policies account for micro microeconomic stru uh, structures. Thus, it is necessary to supplement this with a macroeconomic effort, which leads to our third policy recommendation, which is trade liberalization through the lowering of technology importations, customs tax, trade barriers on technological goods, and telecommunications tax. So a, a brief background on that. Uh, there is a high presence of taxes and fees for technological goods. Taxes and tariffs are at around 8 to 10% in ASEAN countries, which cause prices of technological goods to increase. Particularly, it is very high compared to our neighbors elsewhere in the world. Uh, this makes these types of goods extremely unaffordable to some people. Taking into account the standard of living in most ASEAN countries, which are developing by nature, it is relatively a high price for the citizens to swallow and to afford. So when we lower trade barriers, we lower prices of technological goods. So if prices become more affordable, it would be increase the potential of buying or availing a technological device or service. In fact, Greenwood in 2010 states that the presence of a mobile device increases productivity and in turn increase the potential salary of a particular person. 
when technological goods would become more available to the lower income communities, technological gap would be reduced, thus welfare inequality as well. So when there is trade liberalization, not only would it benefit the consumers, but also the firms. Firms can sell now at lower prices while maintaining the same profit or even increased profit. For example, nowadays, phones don't get designed, assembled, and sold in the same country. In fact, it is designed in country A, assembled in country B, and sold at country C. When there is trade liberalization, phone parts may be brought at cheaper prices, which could further decrease production costs. And of course, consumers can buy at lower prices. And lastly, it lessens the market power of existing oligopolies and monopolies. This is especially true in the ASEAN, wherein there is only one or two big players in the tech landscape, particularly for mobile telecommunications. And this would allow greater competition, which would foster increased competition in the region. So in conclusion, the digital inequality that is present in ASEAN and even the world is just as profound as the income inequality. This is an issue that should be addressed in the fast-paced era of technolo uh, technology development. Digital and income inequality can be alleviated through our three policies, namely, first, advancing software literacy through the BDC, second, accessible public Wi-Fi through PPP, and third, trade liberalization through lowering trade barriers. All these policies are in an effort to reduce wage inequality in the ASEAN by promoting a greater sense of digital inclusiveness and making technology and its many advancements and innovations more accessible even to the lower income side of the population. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Justin, for implementing some of the uh, theories that you've learned from your three professors and also the other professors who are not here. Okay. But at any rate, um, as you can see, this is how economists manage conferences. They're very efficient. We're at 10.30, and according to this, we will have an open forum. So, yes, uh, there will be an open forum for uh, uh, Pauli Castillo and uh, Mr. Eloriaga. Uh, please identify yourself and your institution and address your question to uh, Justine or to Pauline. Otherwise, I will ask questions. No, no, yes, no, no, no. yes, please, please, please. We have two microphones there for your uh, convenience. Morning, I'm Brenda Mendoza from Mexico. Oh, okay. Not a member of the ASEAN, but a supporter. <laughs> Thank you very much, Brenda. Okay. Yeah, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Eloriaga. Uh, your three policy recommendations are they in order of implementation, yeah. or you can apply, uh, use them all at the same time, or they should be in order? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Paul. So for, uh, for in, during our presentation in economics, we did suggest that um, the policies be instituted chronologically in order. And in fact, uh, the current administration, President Duterte, is actually doing a very similar rollout of his ICT initiative. So it's actually matching some of the policy recommendations. So he's now currently at stage two, so which is the public Wi-Fi, but he's not doing it through PPP. It's just of, his, of the government's own initiatives. But currently he's doing it in public areas with high populations, for example, uh, airports and national parks. So that's where he's implementing it. Um, for the BEC revisions, uh, it, it is being, it's currently being talked about, I believe, by uh, by some of the revisions in the which uh, which plans to include coding, elementary coding. So that's JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and actually elementary levels for that. You have a follow-up, Brenda? Yeah. Yes, well, yeah I was we have 30 actually, more minutes. Oh my God. <laughs> I was actually going to ask him about the basic coding because if it's going to be at the elementary level, yes. then uh, the first time I had the coding was in I think college already. Yes. <laughs> but now you're, you're yes. although I know that there are uh, apps yes. available Definitely. online that will yes. teach you, uh, children coding through games. Yes. So maybe oh. that's I can show a little bit of evidence for that because as a student of La Salle we were actually taught coding in around 
this around elementary levels as well. And we were able to adapt quite quickly because it was uh, rolled out in such a way that the, the software support for at least how we learned it was quite intuitive to understand. So it wasn't this approach that uh, you just bring all the codes and hope to learn it. It was thought very, uh, very in a very gradual pace that I think students would be able to understand. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? Well, then I have a question. Oh, no. <laughs> well, this is a question to uh, Pauline. Okay. Yes. Uh, I was part of that research yes, team on uh, these creative industries. But what are the ASEAN initiatives in uh, exploring the opportunities of uh, the creative industries? Um. I think for the most part, this was one of the first initiatives, which is to bring together or to identify uh, where the different ASEAN countries are going to be able to fit into a, uh, I, I, the idea there was to create a global services hub. So uh, hopefully it was going to be a regional uh, production network for the various uh, creative, uh, for the various uh, subsectors under the creative industries. So Area's first step uh, there was to locate where all the countries are in the ASEAN along the global, uh, the value chain. So for the Philippines at that time, 2010-2011, uh, majority of those who belong to the uh, digital animation industry was really in the subcontracting work. And we were hoping to be able to move up the value chain. But if you're going to create a regional production network within the ASEAN, then that's what the Filipinos can offer at that time. Uh, I, I think now what we are trying to do is to figure out where we all fit. Um, at Indonesia was not looking at creative industries, digital animation. They were looking at fashion design. So they were also looking at where Indonesia was in the product, in the value chain. Uh, for textile or for fashion design and uh, suggesting uh, how they will fit in a regional production network within the ASEAN if that is indeed the goal. So I, I, we were on the first step in 2010-2011 which was locating ourselves in the value chain. I am not quite sure now exactly where we are at. And what we were trying to identify at that time was are there enough enabling uh, policies within the ASEAN region so that we can indeed form uh, a regional production network or that we can enable the various countries to move up the value chain. So that's why we put in the trade and services APAS. In fact, uh, trade and services are, are, are uh, can be highly encouraged or can grow because of the various uh, liberalization efforts done within the ASEAN region. I was thinking in terms of the training programs as oh, well as exploring programs, yes. the culture common to the ASEAN. Oh, you're right, sir. Uh, for example, I see, well, of course, I was thinking in terms of batik, no? okay, but that's yeah, not that's creative industry. Paper. It's part of creative industry, yes. but it's on fashion design. <coughs> but um, there are several myths within the region yes. that we can use, okay, okay as uh, subjects for. Uh, animation okay yes. and I think yeah. Malaysia has explored this yeah. I don't know and they were thinking in terms of a, a regional yeah. school where the animators can be trained not technically but in terms of uh, uh, the culture okay exploring uh, the culture and finding from the culture some themes that they can ex explore okay and they can use are there other questions I uh, uh, yes uh, from uh, our friend from uh, the LSU, Desmarinas. Sorry, my, my name is William Tinono from De La Salle, Desmarinas. Uh, I just wanted to uh, clarify something from the second uh, presentation. Uh, but I enjoyed your presentation, very innovative research. I was just wondering, uh, what was the other variables considered in this study? And I was wondering, because you used Gini, don't know whether how many data points that you used. Before he answered that, I said, temper on econometrics, because <laughs> these are not all economists. But at any rate, since you asked the question, he loves yeah. econometrics. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So for the regression that we did, actually the model there is not complete. So of course the variable and the percentage of internet users was was there, uh, but we did include other variables such as land uh, land attainment. I'm not too sure of all the variables because actually the regression was done by my partner. Uh, so we split the task. Uh, and then there were other factors there and other social demographic factors because of course if we just have one variable which is the percentage of internet users, the model would likely fail because of omitted variable bias. For the Gini index, I believe the period was from 2008 until 2015. Uh, I, I can't be too sure on that because I, I have not seen the data set to get, because my partner had done that. My apologies for not being able to answer that. Yes, Brenda? Sorry for taking the floor again. But anyway, uh, for Ms. Uh, Kaskiri, um, we talk, I hear a lot about global value chains yes. and uh, trying, needing to uh, link up with regional production networks. But um, I have this feeling, or maybe just a wild idea, that maybe we should uh, try to, um, to uh, identify where in the value chain is the <coughs> highest value created and then target that uh, that mm. node or link. You're talking yeah. about the flagship and yeah. that's usually <laughs> the one who does the conceptualizing. Yeah. So you're so, talking about Disney, you're talking about DreamWorks if it's in the digital animation subsector. So it's in the conceptual Yes, sir. Uh, yes, miss. Because uh, then the idea is yours, and co coupled with intellectual property, whatever profits, royalties, etc., would go to the owner of the idea, and that's okay. not where we are. Okay, uh, that's not but, where. We okay, are. so when where is the second? So that uh, we can maybe develop the. Uh, then history. you can talk about. Oh, I, forgive my yeah. cheat sheet. It's okay. Um, <laughs> I took it out of the PowerPoint slide because I have 40 of them. Um. <laughs> so you're looking at the next one would be pre-production. In other words, creating a pro prototype. From the idea, then you need something more solid if you can even apply that term to digital animation. But you know, how do you transform the idea into a physical or corporeal. So these are the graphic artists? Uh, these are the graphic artists, the one who would say, okay, you need a genie in Aladdin. Uh, what would a genie look like? And what personality would you attribute to it? So that would be in the pre-production as well as in the production stage. And we're not there either. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> not most of our local firms are there. No, unfortunately not. We are really in the, once all of that is done, and then so you have a prototype, this is what the genie will look like, more or less this is the, the attributes that the genie will possess, uh, then you can subcontract that. So to create the entire film, to create the entire series, or to create the digital game. It's really knowledge. It is knowledge, it is ideas. And Dr. Tuyao is correct in saying that we are rich in it in the ASEAN, if we can tap into our culture, we can tap into our myths if we can if we can tap into our legends. Yes. So uh, the the ones that I know are mostly <laughs> Disney. So I'm a Disney baby. <laughs> Before that question, okay. you know, don't ask me to be a moderator because I will answer some of your questions. Yesterday, if you have listened to the State of the Nation address, President Duterte mentioned about <clears throat> this. Uh -huh. Instead of exporting the raw materials mm -hmm. that we produce, we have to process them. Yeah, but the right. problem yeah, in yeah. processing are the other inputs needed for processing. Mm -hmm. Do we have the technology? Do we have the human resources? And we do we have the other requirements to process? So if we don't have, and if we do, it may have a higher cost. Mm -hmm. Of course, Dr. Vidalia, who is the goddess of uh, <laughs> what's your dissertation on? The domestic resource cost. Yeah, we I can think. produce an airplane in this country, but the domestic resource yeah. cost is tremendous. Yeah. That's according yeah. to Vidalia 19, <laughs> I won't mention it. <laughs> okay. Okay, but any rate, uh, that, that's my point. Yes, uh, okay. 
I'm Ben Simmons, I'm the chairperson of the animation program of CSP, and I am also uh, was the president of the animation council back 2013-2015. In terms of the of the value chain, the first really is the concept conceptualization. You have the ideas, and part of that is also the pre-production, where you also, you create the storyboard and the character design, the production design, the art direction. Now, the industry has been here since 1986. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we've been making Dragon Ball Z, Powerpuff Girls. I, for one, uh, animated before Powerpuff, Flintstones. Oh, wow. Because we are more uh, known in the uh, in outsourcing, in yeah, creating yeah, the production yeah. side of things. Yes. But in terms of the, uh, creating our own stories, that's yes. what the industry are, are lacking. Mm -hmm. That's why, on, on, on my part personally, I became a full-time teacher in CSP because we want to create our own original content. Mm -hmm. So that's why the direction now, for us, for, for example, in CSB in Vinyl, we are now creating a, a content created with the students. Yes. Yeah. And as far as the video is concerned, we already created several animated content in our incubation, okay. which we call Toon Bro. Toon for cartoons and Bro for brother, obviously. Yeah. So we did an animation of the Life of Saint Lasal, we did the oh, Life of Saint Vinyl, yeah. So, oh, puro santo na, like, kami ng langin. <laughs> and we're also, we're also, uh, brother Mike also, this, uh, uh, we're also discussing uh, animated on, on the, on the, you know, Catholic social teaching and all the, and the Lasalan values. So, so, so puro, puro langin. <laughs> but the, the, the point is, because of the, the industry right now, in terms of the, of the, the support, just like what uh, uh, Dr. Tulos uh, said earlier, it's very expensive to create a content. Yes. We, are, we have the talents here, we have the, even the yes. technology, we also already have it here. But the problem is very expensive to create our, even a, a, a TV series. For example, for abs cbn or JMA to buy your series, you, you first have to have the 13 episodes of a series. So it's a chicken and egg situation. How can you produce a 13 episode of 30 minute? When it, uh, uh, 30, uh, a 30 minute uh, animated series almost cost $300,000 to $400,000. So it's very expensive in, in terms of how you're going to create those content. Oh, it's like 100,000 100, huh? millions of dollars if you're going to create animated feature films like uh, Pixar or Disney. That's true. And then, of course, if it's your, the idea is yours, the, the merchandising that follows will also be yours, right? Yeah. So if we can somehow, uh, yeah. you know, market the life yes. of St. Vinil to other Lasallian schools around the world. Yeah, right now, that's what our, our problem is. We have several contexts, but how do we monetize this one? Yes. For example, there are several animated contexts created by the students, which can have a potential for a TV series. Uh -huh. But, but because if, if we don't have the budget or the, uh, the planning how to monetize that, it's just their capstone and we just save it to so archive them. Yeah, so that's the problem right now. Baka pwede natin gawin sa the Lasal Philippines, they can use it as educational material for all the Lasal. The market is very limited. Uh, Gloria. <laughs> I'm not so familiar with what uh, Dr. Castillo is talking about here, but it just occurred to me, <coughs> at what particular stage in the digital animation process will we consider ethics and or ethical considerations? Uh, unfortunately, ma'am, I am not also very uh, familiar with ethics. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an industry analyst. Actually, my very first job was industry analysis. But I, I'm not sure exactly about ethics. So ethics pertaining to how we treat content, like culture, belief system, culture, and the like. belief, yes. yes, that's very true. We will need to be very careful about that. Especially if you're talking about the life of Saint Vinil and the lives yeah. of the saints and everything else, there has to be ethical concerns. But I guess that will come with the industry and the market itself. I, I'm not sure about ethics, Thomas. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, the ethical implication of this is intellectual property, okay? Because you are copying, okay? Uh, you, nothing is original, okay? You have to, uh, 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 what do you call this, recognize that some of these concepts were derived from. Okay? So those are the ethical uh, considerations. 
Well, we teach this in, in, in research. At any rate, yes, Francis. This is getting animated. No? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody uh, needs to keep doing it. To, uh, to Dr. Castillo. Uh, um, I'm just wondering, uh, because the Philippines, um, we already had two movies animated um, yeah. Yeah. in 2008, Urduva, and mm -hmm. in 2010, RPG Metanoia. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah, on the Dayo, and um, very recently. Uh, but were you able to um, interview the sectors or the animators? The, I, the, no, um, I actually just interviewed the 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 organic the industry association, but uh, and what I got from them is what I also put in the paper. Yeah, because my uh, my question would be, yes. uh, I was looking at the ratings yeah. that and also the the amount of revenue that yeah. these films generated, yeah. and somehow but, it um, occurs to me that perhaps there's no. Uh, or there's limited yeah. appreciation of uh, domestic um, digital animation, or maybe the demand is weak for these services. Um, so, what what is your perspective? Because I'm looking at it, demand for animation per se. Uh, I think it's growing in the Philippines. I mean, mainly the Japanese animation, the the Korean animation TV series. There's a following of it in the Philippines. Uh, whether you're looking at television, whether you're looking at uh, internet source animated series, uh, our our young generation certainly are followers. But there doesn't seem to be one for local uh, culture and belief system. So I, I don't know if it is because we don't know. I, I don't know. I'm speaking out of turn maybe. Do we not teach that in basic and education where we have an appreciation for our own culture? Mm -hmm. So that when we translate it into products like services and, and you know goods that they will be patronized or that they will be uh, they will be bought uh, by the younger generation. I am not sure, but you're right, there is very little appreciation for local uh, uh, local animation series. But if you're looking at animation per se, there's a great demand for it. Just, not just in the global and in the Philippines. I don't know how to pique the interest of young Filipinos in our own culture, belief system, translated to animated series. Except through education, but maybe because I'm, a, you know, I'm in the education business. If we teach them about these things, they would look for it uh, outside of the classroom. That's how I see it. That's how I see it with my students. Yeah. I, I pique their interest in the classroom and they take off. I'm not sure if that is true of everybody. Thank you. Are there other questions? Yes, ma'am, please. Um, good morning. I'm Max Batramos, also from NETA. So my question is for Justin. By the way, we are intensively hiring in NETA, so if you want to apply. He will be teaching. He can teach and work in government at the same time. Um, so my question is on your third policy recommendation, which is trade pluralization. Um, I noticed that the policy is, um, the recommendation is concentrated on reducing the tariff yeah. on technolo technological goods. So I just want to ask if you look into um, areas in trade and services that could also be liberalized to help technological advancement in the country. Uh, thank you for that question. That was actually the same question of the judge in the competition. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, for our study, we limited to just uh, the tariffs and the, uh, the trade. So that was our limitation because um, one of the focuses in the guidelines for the competition was just to focus on digital inequality. So um, we focused on the study of Greenwood in 2010. He suggested that um, he, no he noticed a trend in the ASEAN countries that the cost of basic technological goods, so even like the, so there are three tiers in technological goods, so low and mid and then high. So for the low tier, it's actually the price is inflated in ASEAN countries compared to if you compare the price of that same good in Europe and even in the US. So he said that maybe there could be something done about the prices because countries 
in the ASEAN can only benefit, uh, the lower income population can only benefit if they can access these low tier devices, which are actually, which are actually increasing in their quality since then. So uh, he, he did suggest that as much as possible, the cost for these devices should be as minimal as possible. And one way to do that is to lower the barriers for that. So with regards to trade and services, we did not look into that. So we just focused on that. Thank you for that question. Do you want to comment? No, okay. no, I was passing the microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's really fast. Uh, are there other questions? Otherwise, I will close close the session if there are no objections. There being none, the session is closed. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.